The book of Luke, chapter 5. We'll be reading from the gospel passage. The good. Book of Luke, chapter 5, verses 17 through 20. This is what has been recorded. One day, Jesus was teaching, and there were some Pharisees and teachers of the law sitting there. How many know that Jesus had some ops? He had some haters, the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the teacher of the law, and they would go wherever he was with a critical spirit. They weren't really interested in truth. They were interested in trapping him because Jesus was a threat to their power. But as we see in the gospels time and time again, Jesus is doing his thing. And people have come from every village of Galilee and Judea and from Jerusalem. But I want you to see this. And the scripture says, and the power of the Lord was present for him to perform healing. Not only is he teaching There is a distinct anointing on Jesus in this moment, the power, the capacity to heal. I need you to know that God is still healing, that Jesus is still showing up, that that his power hasn't ceased. He still has the capacity and the ability to perform miracles in the midst of an assembly When he's present, there's always the potential for something to pop off in a good way. You need to know that whenever you come into the house of the Lord, where two or three are gathered in his name, there he is also. Where his presence is, there's always the potential for God to move, which is why you got to walk in expectation. Sometimes God is moving, but because we don't have expectation, we miss what he's doing because we're so busy trying to get to the next moment that we miss the current moment. And God is saying, I'm looking for a church that can lock in and recognize the moment. Because when Jesus is ready to perform miracles, you might be next. Scripture says that the power of the Lord was present for him to perform healing. And some men were carrying on a bed, if you can imagine a stretcher, a man who was paralyzed. They were trying to bring him in and set him down in front of Jesus, but not finding any way to bring him in because of the crowd. They went up on the roof and let him down through the tiles with his stretcher into the middle of the crowd in front of Jesus. Now, I want you to focus on this. Seeing their faith, according to verse 20, Jesus said, friend, your sins are forgiven. Seeing the faith of the friends and the paralytic, Jesus makes a statement. If you continue reading the passage, you'll see not only were his sins forgiven spiritually, but his body was healed physically. Seeing their faith, Jesus said, friend, your sins are forgiven. This is the word of the Lord. And the people of God said, Amen. amen. I want to preach today from the topic, we've come this far by faith. You may be seated. We've come this far by faith. Holy Spirit, you are here. The scriptures have been read now. Holy Spirit, make the written word rhema. Let it leap off of the page. Use me as a vessel, as a conduit to say what you want me to say. That it might reach people and help them, like the paralytic, get up and walk. Strengthen our faith, but help us understand what faith is and what it isn't. This we pray in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. I shared with you earlier that we're on the other side of a major milestone. And I talked earlier about missing the moment. When we miss the moment, usually there's two problems. Sometimes the problem is a problem of nostalgia. We're so busy reflecting on what was that we can't recognize what is. And we can't muster enough focus to pay attention to what shall be. When we focus on our past, sometimes it's the glory days of our past. Sometimes it's the mistakes of our past. Some of us are so focused on how we messed up that we miss the opportunity to receive the healing of God and begin to walk into a necessary future. 
And then some of us are so overwhelmed and anxious about the future. We're so busy thinking about the next thing that we miss the current thing. And when we miss the current thing, we miss our opportunity to be prepared for the next thing. Even now, people are thinking about what they're going to eat after service. Some of y'all are thinking about Thanksgiving right now as I speak. And you're saying, you know what, preacher, I know it's good to be here. Hallelujah. Praise, praise the Lord. The power of God is here. But, but I know the lines at the supermarket are going to be long. And I still haven't gotten my turkey. I haven't got my greens, beans, tomatoes, potatoes, <laughs> lambs, ramp. You, you, you. And the fact that you have to host for Thanksgiving has you preoccupied. And you're thinking about the people. You're thinking about the tablecloths. And you're thinking about how long it's going to take you to cook your greens and you need to roast the turkey, all that type of stuff. Be careful. You might miss the moment. So busy thinking about what's going to happen after service that you miss service. Or for some of us, it's further in the future. You have concerns about what you're going to, what you're going to do with your life after 2023 is done. You, you have concerns about what's next. You're in between jobs, you're in between homes, you're in between relationships. You have very real concerns. Some of you are worried about your biological clock ticking. And it's not that you think about this every once in a while. This has consumed you to the point that you can't enjoy the moment. You're thinking about the person that you wish was here that's not here. You think about the person that hasn't arrived yet and when that person is going to come. But God wants to give us an anointing for the now. It's recognizing the now. It's recognizing moments. It's recognizing milestones where we are able to mark what God has done and sense what he's getting ready to do. And I'm here to tell you that the 4020 weekend was bigger than just celebrating my birthday. It was bigger than just recognizing 20 years of ministry. It is the affirmation that God is in this. It is the affirmation that eight years ago when when the bishop had to transition and this new guy came up the ranks, that that God was in it, that God's hand has been on it, and God's hand will continue to be on it. It was a reminder that the oil is still flowing. It was a reminder that the horn hasn't dried up. The ram's horn is still ready and flowing oil And if the oil flows from the head down and comes down the beard of Aaron, then you've got to understand that as a congregational, as someone who's attending, as someone who is a member, if there's oil in the house, if you stay put, it's flowing to you. It's recognizing that this just wasn't the elevation of Pastor Dexter and Pastor Lindsay. This is the elevation of New Vision International Ministries. And if you're a part of New Vision International Ministries, you were elevated too. The pastoral leadership team was elevated. The elders were elevated. The ordained ministers were elevated. The I am students were elevated. The executive Executive leaders were elevated. Every volunteer, every hallway host, every sanctuary servant, every parking lot attendant, every hospitality team member, every children's church worker, every middle school teacher, every high school leader. If you are in this flow, the elevation is for you too. Tell somebody, I recognize the moment. But it's important to know how we got here. We didn't get here by hook or crook. (laughs) We didn't get here because everything was easy for us. Institutionally speaking, this church started in the basement of Bishop and Lady Sharon Calhoun with 14 people. There was no building in the very beginning. There was less than a dozen couple of dozen people in one place who just heard from the Lord and by faith they began to work and to build out something. They had no clue what it would eventually become, but they had a word from the Lord. You need to understand that we didn't get here because somebody gave us something. We didn't get to this point 
because we were able to politically gain favor. We didn't get to this point because someone underwrit all of our ministry. We didn't get to this point because we were so smart. We didn't get to this point because we were so good looking. We didn't get to this point because we were so witty. We didn't get to this point because we crossed every T and dotted every I. We didn't get to this point because we always did it the right way because honestly, we have made mistakes and we still make mistakes and we will make mistakes. We got this far by faith. We didn't get this far by trusting in our own effort. We didn't get this far by copying what other people were doing and just doing that. We needed a word from the Lord at every stage of development in this ministry. And look at where we are now. Sometimes I don't think we realize what God has done. We went from meeting in the basement of our bishop to finding a few itinerant places to meeting in bars and meeting in schools. And then God gave us a building within three years of existence. You can't even get a bank loan without three full years of statements. And somebody gave us a loan so we could get a building, a property on the south end of Bridgeport, and we were there for 16 years, and then out of the blue, we got a phone call to come see this building. Some of you weren't there, but I was there. Karen Briggs was there. Tanya Skeeter was there. Elder Mack was there. The first time we walked into this building, we came through that back corner, and all you saw was warehouse space. I could stand from that door and look all the way to Wood Avenue from where some of you are sitting right now. There were no walls. There was no HVAC. There was no carpet. There were no nicely padded chairs. There wasn't a proper electrical service. There weren't nice bathrooms on this side of the building. But we came this far by faith. And we believe that God spoke something into our life. And we believe that it was God initiative and divine initiative. And somehow, some way, we came together in 2018 and we believed God for the impossible. We believe that maybe, just maybe, God was taking us to another place. Maybe, just maybe, that building belonged to us. And here we are five years later under 69,000 square feet of property. I'm a little warm right now because the heat works. See, sometimes we take things for granted. I remember the first winter in 35 Benham. We didn't have no real heat. We were putting lanterns all across the building trying to bring up the temperature just a little bit. We had a real shandai in sweaters and in jackets and in full winter coats just trying to worship. I thank God for the AC because I remember the first service. There wasn't any AC blowing, but there was a wind of the Holy Spirit and a bunch of industrial fans. We couldn't have hear the sound because the fans were blowing in the background. We have no carpet. We were here the night before trying to brush away and mop away all of the construction dust because we were still under construction. We didn't have these nicely padded chairs. We had folding chairs, borrowed folding chairs from tent revivals, and we set them up, and we wanted them to look nice, and we would come here before service, and we would put 600 wedding chair covers on metal folding chairs. We sold our last building before we acquired this one. By faith, believing that the deal would go through. We acquired this building without zoning approval. By faith. But we walked into zoning. By faith. Unanimous approval. By faith. Then we had to actually build and do construction. And I had pastors who had done building projects before. And they were smiling. They said, you know, this is a lot of work. I said, well, we're hoping to get in um, by the end of the year. And they said, oh, yeah, really? <laughs> what should have taken two years took nine months. <laughs> and, and as we progress forward, I need you to be reminded that we've come this far 
By faith. I know we're not a Baptist church. I know we're not an old Pentecostal church. But every once in a while, you got to lean on where you come from. There was a season in my life, we used to sing this song, We Come This Far By Faith. And I don't know what it was about that song. But sometimes I would sing it and tears would come to my eye because I began to understand legacy. I began to understand that people paved the way before me. I began to understand that it's not by might, not by power, but by his spirit, says the Lord. We've come this far by faith. And I'm here to tell you, New Vision, wherever we're going, we got to get there by faith. Whatever we are stepping into next, this next season, we can't get here by faith and then neglect faith to get to the next place in God. No, we've got to strengthen our faith. We've got to come back to Jesus. We've got to get back to the altar because before we had an altar, we had an altar. Before we had a building, we were able to put our faith to the ground wherever we were and wherever we were standing was holy ground. We made the tabernacle a place of praise because people came in before service and prayed and cried and put oil over the floor so that when people came, they would feel the power and the presence of God. The crazy thing is you can have a building and not have anybody praying for it, that we can rest on our laurels. But I'm here to tell you, if we want to go to the next level, if we want to get to the next thing, we got to get some of that power pioneering spirit back. Whatever we have is because God gave it to us. And if we want more, we've got to get back to that gritty place where we put our face on the carpet, where we put our face on the altar. And we say, God, we want to be a part of whatever's next, but we're going to get there by faith. We're not going to get there by flesh. We're not going to get there through manipulation. We're not going to get there because we think we're so smart and so brilliant. We're going to get there by faith. Somebody say, we've come this far by faith, and we're going to get there by faith. But here's the million-dollar question. What is faith? That's the question. What is faith? Because people have a lot of opinions about faith. There are entire denominations that center on the concept of now faith. There are places and preachers who put an overemphasis on faith. We live in a culture that embraces faith even though they don't call it that. So the question is, what is faith? Definition of faith is strong confidence in and reliance upon someone or something. You know what I've noticed about today's culture? Everybody has faith for something, but not enough people have faith in someone. See, when people have faith for something, they fix their eyes on what they want. They fix their eyes on what their desires are. They fix their eyes on what they think they should have. And I want you to be careful because this manifestation stuff is going to get some of y'all in trouble. Oh, let me go talk over here. I'm, I'm speaking to those of us who are getting caught up in new age spirituality and you're frustrated because what you feel like Jesus should have provided, he hasn't provided yet. So you say, I'm going to go find it somewhere else. I'm going to go find my own path. I'm going to burn a little sage. I'm going to do a little ritual. I'm going to write things over and over again until it comes because my favorite YouTube influencer or my favorite Instagram influencer told me that that's how you get what you want. Be careful that you don't find yourself in witchcraft. Manifestation. True manifestation comes from the only one who can manifest. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without void. There was a creator who stood outside of time, space, and matter, spoke the world into existence. Why would I pray to the universe when I serve Yahweh, who's greater than the universe? He stands outside of space, time, and matter. Why would I pray to something impersonal? When the scripture reveals that I can have a personal relationship with the creator of the universe, God's not somewhere over the rainbow. He's here. He's near. He's now, although he could sequester himself in heaven, he shows up when I pray to him. He speaks to me. And according to the scripture, the veil was ripped when Jesus gave up the ghost. And now we can enter into the holies of holies. He's made a way for us to have a connection and a relationship with him. You need to know that God is personal. God in three persons, blessed Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, three in one. It's a mystery how they cooperate to make the Godhead, but I need you to understand that we serve a God who is a person. So we don't have faith for stuff apart from faith in a person. 
See, the definition says that we have strong confidence in and reliance upon someone or something. Everybody has faith in something. The question is, where's your faith? See, when you walked into this sanctuary, you didn't do a five-point inspection of the seats that you're sitting in. You sat in that seat by faith. You had faith that that seat could hold your blessed assurance. You, you sat down with confidence in the seat. You put faith in that seat. People put faith in all types of things, but anything that's man-made can fail. Any person that can be elevated can betray you. Any person that has to be relied upon in the earth can fall short, but there's one who never fails. There's one who is all-perfect, all-knowing, all-powerful, and according to the scriptures, we place our faith in him. So your faith should be in God and not in people. Your faith should be in the Father, rather than just having faith for stuff, and for some of us, that's the disconnect. We've been so focused on trying to have faith for stuff that we've missed the primary responsibility is to have faith in God. And we're trying to get the stuff apart from the God who is able to provide the stuff. And somewhere along the way, we stop believing Matthew 6 and 33. Now, some of you are new believers. You've never heard this before, but Matthew 6 and 33 says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and his, and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. That means that if we seek first the kingdom of God, then we don't have to chase after stuff, then stuff chases after us. I'm talking about whatever you need. Because if you read the scripture a little bit earlier, it says, don't you worry about what you're going to eat or what you're going to drink because your heavenly father knows what you need. We spoke last week to that orphan spirit. You need to know that you have a daddy that's in heaven. You have a father that's in heaven. He knows exactly what you need. He knows exactly when you need it. You don't have to run around here dazed and confused because as long as you know your father, he knows what you have need of. And to trust him is to trust his hand. But you've got to learn how to seek his face. If you get his face, you'll get his hand. Tell somebody, don't worry about what you're going to eat or what you're going to drink. For your heavenly father knows what you need, when you need it, how you need it. He knows when it's going to come, how it's going to come. Tell somebody, just chill. Tell somebody, stop stressing. Stop worrying. It ain't going to add a dollar to your bank account. It ain't going to add an inch to your height. It's not going to remove the gray hairs in your head. It's not going to make your waist get any smaller. The worry's not going to help you. The only one that can help you is God himself. Tell somebody, I don't have faith for stuff. I got faith in God. Because if the stuff doesn't come, as long as I've got King Jesus, as long as I've got a relationship with the Lord, as long as I've got a connection with the Father, as long as I've been redeemed by the Son, as long as the Holy Spirit lives inside of me, I'm gonna be all right. Tell somebody my faith is in Jesus. Which brings us to our passage for today. It brings us to the text. Because in this moment, we see the faith of five guys. I'm not talking about that restaurant. I'm not talking about the restaurant with the big burgers. I get a little bacon cheeseburger because the big cheeseburger is too big. I get the small fries because the large fries enough to feed a family of five. We see the faith of five guys. How do we know it's five guys? Because in this particular passage of Scripture, we see it across the Gospels. And according to the Scripture, there were five men, one paralytic and four friends. Now, to be paralyzed means that you can't move. You can't get around on your own. You are immobile. You can't walk. You have to rely on other people to get you from one place to the next. And so can you just walk with me for just a moment to, to dig deeper in the text and to, to put ourselves in the same position as these men? They heard about Jesus. 
And this man had been paralyzed. The scripture doesn't say how long. But it seems like they were together and they decided to put together a plan. They said, you know what? Here's what we're going to do. We're going to get to Jesus. I heard about this man named Jesus. Now, Jesus and his works were getting buzzed all across the land. This is before Twitter. I'm sorry, X. This is before Instagram or Facebook or a 24-hour news cycle. People would talk about what was happening in the land, and Jesus was the talk of the town. And everywhere he went, Jesus drew haters, but then he also drew people who were on the fence. And I need you to understand something about serving God, serving the Father. Sometimes we're so obsessed with the people that don't like us. We're so fixated on those who aren't with us that we fail to realize that there's a population of people who need to hear what we have. And so we shouldn't fear men in opposition. We should want to accomplish the assignment because there were people who were showing up to see, is this man Jesus for real? Is he really about that life? Can he really perform miracles? So in this particular instance, Jesus was in a house. And according to this text, this house was packed, and then there was a crowd outside of the house. So now you have these five guys Four friends and one paralytic, they say, you know what, we're going to get up and we're going to go to Jesus because if we get to Jesus, then maybe our friend will be made whole. Now, I need you to think about the logistics of this. Some scriptures say a bed. Other scriptures say a stretcher. There had to be some type of apparatus to carry him on. It wasn't just a little yoga mat. It wasn't just a towel. It had to be something structurally that each of them could carry. And yes, maybe his muscles were atrophied. Maybe he wasn't that heavy. But I get tired carrying my three-year-old. How many of you got some toddlers and they start growing up? And you say, child, you're too big for me to pick you up. You start strategically putting them down. You start strategically telling them, you're going to have to walk for yourself. Come on, walk up the stairs. Come on, I'll grab your hand. But this man could not walk for himself. So his friend said, this is what we're going to do. We're going to pick you up. We're going to put you on this stretcher, and we're going to carry you to Jesus. Now, for there to be a crowd that was so big that they couldn't get to Jesus, just think about all of the people. You had the outer court of the crowd. They get to the place where Jesus is, and they see all the people. That would have been enough for us to turn back. That would have been enough. That's why I don't like concerts. The outer court is what gets me. The outer court, I'm talking about the parking. I'm talking about the traffic. I'm talking about having to walk from Maryland to the concert. Because so many are people that that's enough for me to turn around and to go back home. But but somehow they get through the crowd. Excuse Excuse me. Excuse me. Excuse me. It's hard enough for you by yourself to sift through a crowd but they're carrying a whole person, four of them, and they got to be strong enough to carry a whole person and keep balance and make sure they don't drop him. That's what I would have been thinking about. I ain't trying to drop you, bro. We had a family member drop something off at our house. It was some of that old school furniture from a great aunt. They make furniture different back then than they do now. This Ikea stuff. This Walmart stuff, this Target stuff, it ain't like the stuff they used to make in the 30s and the 40s. And so this was one of those big old China cabinets. That joker was heavy. And we had to move and pause. (laughs) Anybody know what I'm talking about? Move. All right, hold on a second, hold on a second, hold on a second. Hold on a second. Whoo, this thing heavy. All right, you good? You good? Pick up again. Move and pause. Then we had to get in the door. We had to go up the stairs. Then we had to get between the door and the foyer. So now I got to back up. Okay, wait, 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 wait. Turn, turn, turn. All the logistics just to move something that's heavy. Imagine having to navigate bringing a whole person through a crowd in a place you've never been before to see someone you've never seen before. So somehow they're carrying him and they negotiate through the crowd and they get to the house But how many of you know a crowd outside of the house is different than a crowd inside of the house? Because now we got to get into a door. Now we got to get past the kitchen. Now we get past here and there to get to the living room where Jesus is. Too many turns, too many nooks, too many cranes. And plus, once people are inside, they ain't moving. Just like when you get your good seat, you ain't moving. 
You get your good parking spot, you ain't moving. I earned this parking spot. I ain't moving. You don't know what I had to get through to get to this particular point. You don't know how early I showed up to get this good seat because I want to see Jesus too. It went from the outer court to the inner court. Now they're standing at the door of the house. I don't know if it was the back porch or the front porch, but most of us would have given up. Say, hey, man, we did, a, we did the best we could. You're going to have to lean your ear in to hear Jesus. Can you hear him? Shh. <laughs> Maybe we get eyesight with them. That's what most of us would have done. But, but these brothers were persistent. One of them said, hey, why don't we do this? If we can get you up on the roof. So they have the boldness to pick this man up on somebody else's roof. Get him to the place where Jesus was, track the voice of Jesus, remove the tiles in the middle of the gathering. Somehow, someway, get one person down, another person down. All right, you down there, we're sending him down in the middle of this gathering. All protocol is broken now. And you see a whole person descending through a hole in a roof. And Jesus looks at them, seeing their faith. See, sometimes faith will cause you to break protocol. <laughs> they may not have been dressed right. They, they may not have understood the order of worship, but, 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 but there's faith there. Seeing their faith, he looks at them and says, your sins are forgiven. And then the Pharisees got mad because who gave you the power to forgive sins? Only God gives, forgives sins. That's blasphemy. And Jesus like, that's the point. I am God in the flesh. And he said, you think that's bad? Watch what I'm about to do. Pick up your bed and walk. And the scripture indicates that he picked up his bed, walked away with forgiveness of his sins and walked away with the very bed that he was carried in on. So here's what I want us to see. I want you to see the faith of these five guys and I want you to understand that that faith sometimes, uh, we have to look at the hallmarks of faith, the attributes of faith. You gotta understand what made their trek spatial. Because some of us, when we think of faith, we think of faith while sitting on our couch. We, we think of faith as chilling in the pew and saying, God's going to do it, and I'm not going to do anything. But faith without works is? And so I want to walk through some things that I see in this passage that can help us as we've come this far by faith, and we're going to get to the next place by faith. There are three things that we see amongst these five men. The first thing we see is initiative. Somebody say initiative. At some point, they were sitting in their home, and they said, hey, let's get a, I have an idea. Let's get to Jesus. Initiative is the ability to put a plan in motion. See, some people talk about things, and then other people rise up and actually take the next step to do what they talk about. And there's nothing worse than people who talk about things. They've been talking about stuff since high school. They've been talking about things since back in the day. They, they've been talking about stuff for years, yet they do not have the type of relationship with God where they take what they believe God is saying. And, and let me help you understand something, Christian believers. This is about divine initiative. This is about hearing from God and getting a sense of, okay, God wants me to head in this particular direction and the willingness to now take steps based on what you believe God is saying. They took initiative. They put a plan in motion. They put their shoes on or their sandals. <laughs> they, they grabbed the mat, the stretcher, and they started walking. Somebody say initiative. They refuse to accept their current situation. And that's where some of us are. We've been, listen to me in the spirit realm, paralyzed for so long. We are utilizing our, our, our paralysis as an excuse not to accomplish anything. See, either you see yourself as victim or victor. Either you see yourself as someone whom God can use or you see yourself as someone whom God has discarded. 
And so they got together and they said, you know what? Our situation has got to change. So we are going to get up. We're going to get mobile. Watch this. I don't know if this plan is going to work, but we're going to do something that's headed towards what we believe God is capable of doing. Somebody say initiative. initiative. Somebody say initiative. initiative. At this season of ministry, we need to have initiative. If you're a leader in this ministry, there's a point where you've got to be a self-starter. You've got to be the type of person that says, okay, I've heard what God is saying. Now let me begin to put plans based on what God said and take the necessary actions to move from here to there. Watch this. His legs weren't working, but he was still mobile. <laughs> He, 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 he was, he was, he, he lacked a physical ability, but he was able to participate in this plan and move towards the calling that God had on his life. Recorded in scripture, we're talking about him now, thousands of years later, because he took initiative. But his initiative, listen to me, wasn't apart from Jesus, it was towards Jesus. See, the danger with some of us is that we're so deep. Hardest thing to do is to argue with someone who said God said. Because <laughs> after you say God said, I guess there's no room for a conversation or maybe. I know there's safety in the multitude of counsel. And, and every, sometimes, saints, people of God, are you sure God said or was it your ambition? Are you sure God said or was it your insecurity seeing an opportunity now to be what you were always denied? Is God speaking or, or are you just trying to rebound from this previous season where things didn't seem like they were working? See, we believe in divine initiative. We move when God says move, just like that. But if he ain't say move, we're going to stay right where he told us to stay. So this initiative is towards Jesus. And, and when we get caught up in the way the world works, sometimes we take initiative away from Jesus. Listen to me. Your dream should not take you away from a thriving relationship with the Lord. Here's the pattern that I see all the time in the church. People are broke, busted, and disgusted. So they come to the house of the Lord. They cry out to the Lord because they ain't got nowhere else to be. They serve in ministry because they ain't got nothing else to do. With the prayer and the hope that somehow God would hear their prayers and answer their prayers and do something in their life. And then when God shows up, when God blesses them, they're like, thank you, see you later. And they forget that there was something deep in the Bible. See, if it's a dream and it takes me away from the dream giver, then it's not really a dream. It's a nightmare. Because my worship and my faith is in the creator, not the thing that I desired. And if it takes me away from my creator, congratulations, it's become an idol. And if it's an idol, the scripture says that God will have no other gods before him. Deaf and dumb idols fall in the presence of a living Savior and a living Lord. And be careful that thing that you propped yourself on, that you now embrace more than you embrace God. Get ready because eventually it's going to fall. So initiative leads us towards Jesus, not away from him. And yes, your seasons change. Yes, what you do in ministry evolves, but there are certain constants because we've come this far by faith. <laughs> when we didn't have nothing, it was our faith in God that got us something. Don't start putting your faith in what you got. Keep your faith in the one who gave you what you got. Because seasons change, things change, people change, jobs change, but God remains the same yesterday, today, and forever. And he's the plug. He's the difference maker. He's the one that was with you in the pit. He's the one that was with you in Potiphar's house. He's the one that was with you in prison. He's the one that's with you in the palace. He is the one that is with you everywhere Joseph went. In the scriptures it says, and the hand of God was on him and he found favor because God was with him. So this is divine initiative. It means you got to move based on what the Lord is leading. Secondly, they had intentionality. 
They had initiative and they had intentionality. Intentionality is the mindset of being purposeful. The intentionality, it's a mindset. There is a goal and I'm headed towards it. And I'm purposeful in my movement. They said, we got to get to Jesus. So when they came and they saw the crowds, they saw the traffic, they had intentionality. No, no, guys, we got a goal. We got to get to Jesus one way or the other. So plan A didn't work, so they picked up plan B. Plan B didn't work, so they picked up plan C. Plan C didn't work. They found a way because they had intentionality. They had purpose in their heart that they were going to do what was placed on their heart to do, and they did it. They were persistent. Too many of us give up too quickly when it's something clearly that God has told us to do. you got to be persistent in this hour. you got to have intentionality. Listen, I want to live my life where everything is intentional. Every relationship is intentional. Every connection is intentional. Every hour I spend, every day that I breathe, I've got more hopefully ahead of me than behind me, but no one knows the day nor the hour. So all I have is now. How intentional are you with now? How purposeful are you with now? Does it take a little bit of trouble to cause you to abort your purpose and your plan? Are you willing to move past and to see that maybe because what's on the other side is so great, that's the reason why I'm having so much opposition, no pain, no gain. Sometimes the best things in life are the things that you had to press towards, the things that you had to pursue, the things that you had to be intentional about. When I locked in to pursuing my wife, I was intentional. She wasn't feeling it, but I know what God said. So I had intentionality. I had the mindset of being purposeful because I know what God said. And if God said that she's for me, then I'm just going to wait. I'm going to do whatever I need to do to follow the voice of what God said. Intentionality. You can't give up when it seems like things aren't going well. You can't give up when the path doesn't seem easy. You can't give up just because there are some obstacles in this new place that God has taken us. Remember, there are still lions, bears, and giants, but giants still are falling. Opportunities are still presenting themselves, but on the other side of opportunity where there are many doors, there are many adversaries, but you've got to have the mindset that if God called me to it, I'm going to be intentional. I'm going to get up to fight again. If I have to take a detour, I'll take a detour. If I have to wait in traffic, I'll wait in traffic. If I have to go another way, if I have to develop another skill, if I have to develop some better and some new relationships, if I've got to get to the place where I'm learning again, if I've got to resubmit myself again, if I've got to fast again, if I've got to pray some more, I'm willing to do whatever it takes to do what God has called me to do. High five somebody and tell them I want to be intentional. I want to be intentional. Everything is strategic. Every person is strategic. Every relationship is strategic. Every task is strategic. Every responsibility is strategic. If you're working in the parking lot, it's strategic. You might just find your wife working the parking lot. You might just find someone important to you. I don't know why I said that, but I'm just saying. You might just find what you need being intentional about where God has positioned you. But you can't give up. Because anytime you do something, especially something that's God ordained, there's going to be turbulence. Sit for a second. There's going to be difficulty. See, when you begin to see what God is telling you, it seems like a slam dunk, and that's strategic. God does that on purpose because when you get a sense of his presence and you get a glimpse of what's possible, it energizes us. Anybody ever been energized by vision? You heard something that God said and your, your mind was blown and you were so excited. That enthusiasm is important because it initiates you. <laughs> but then you get to step two or step three, you realize it's not going to be as easy. <laughs> it's not going to be as easy as I thought. And that's where most of us give up. But intentionality says I have a purpose. There's something I must do. And so if there's a crowd, we'll get past the crowd. If there's a house, we'll get up to the roof. If there's a roof, we'll remove the tiles in the roof. If we got to get them down to the first floor, 
Okay, let's jump down. Let's make it happen. Intentionality. This next stage of ministry, we got to be intentional about everything. Everything. Intentional about the parking lot. With the purpose of being where we're supposed to be. Whether it's small or whether it's great. I, I just sense something. See, see, sometimes people think that the growth of a ministry is based on how big the screen is. And, and yes, you know, the preaching is important, but the parking lot's important too. Because the parking lot is the first place where people encounter the love of God. And so in the old church paradigm, we think, oh, it's the parking lot. Rather than understanding, no, 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 that's where the power is. If we can meet people in the small things, if we can get to the highest level of service in the smallest of things and have that spirit across our organized organism, then what we'll see is excellence that bears fruit. So whatever you do in this season, you've got to be intentional about it. Intentionality. Notice that when they get to Jesus, it's the paralytic that gets his healing. It's the paralytic that gets his legs back. But the four men don't get a gold star. The, the, the four men don't get applause. But God saw their effort. Literally in the scripture, Jesus saw their effort and recognized it. The fact that Jesus sees what you're doing, here it is, this is revelation, that's enough reward. Just the fact that they can look back and say, Jesus saw what I did and said, reference my faith. He saw what we did. When people don't see, God sees. And that's enough. So, so if they never throw a banquet in your honor. See, see, this is the, the, the difficulty of times like this. You advance, you get elevated, and then people start saying, well, why, what about me? What about them? What about they? What about us's? But you know what God has for you is for you. And watch this. You'd rather have your reward in heaven than for somebody to give you something in the earth. Baby, just read the scripture. There's going to be a reward according to your works here on earth. You're going to receive a reward in heaven. It is going to outshine anything that a person can give you on this earth. So in this passage, we see support. Support. There are seasons of your life where you are just called to carry the bed. There are seasons in your life where you are called to be a support system. Well, you're not the main character. And that's okay because God sees your faith. There are seasons where you're not on stage, but you got to be able to find honor and intentionality and initiative in the small things that aren't glamorous. Carrying your friend however many miles is not glamorous with all the dust and the manure on the ground and all them folks pushing and body odor and all that stuff that you got to deal with when you're in a crowd of people in the hot Middle Eastern sun. And now we got to sweat. We've been carrying them all this time. And now we got to sweat and push. Can you imagine how dirty and sweaty and fatigued the friends were, but how happy they were to celebrate the divine encounter that their friends had with Jesus? What type of support network are you in this season? What type of friend are you in this season? Are you willing to go the extra mile, watch this with no direct benefit for yourself apart from just saying, I'm doing what God told me to do? Yeah. Intentionality. Some of us just need to intend to be a better friend. Because some of us were reading that passage and said, that couldn't have been me. I love my friends, but child, all that walking and all them crowds and intentionality and everything. So they had initiative. They had intentionality. The third thing they had was ingenuity. Because they got to the house. There was no clear path. And someone said, hey, this may sound crazy. Hear me out. Hear me out. What if we lifted him up to the roof? Y'all still with me? And 
Once we got him to the roof, we found a spot where we could open up the tiles, and then we drop him in. Nobody had ever done that before. In Scripture, I see no other place where they open up a roof to get someone to Jesus. Ingenuity. Ingenuity is the quality of being resourceful. Well, you don't give up because there's not an apparent way in front of you. But you say, you know what? Where there's a will, there's a way. And if God said it, I'm going to find a way to accomplish the task. If that means I have to change my plans, if that means I have to be flexible, if that means I have to learn a new skill, if that means I have to do something different that I've never done before, if that means that I have to try something that I've never tried before, I'm willing to be resourceful. Ingenuity is what we need. We need the ability to stretch our thinking and to do some things that we haven't done before. In this new season, we're going to do some things we've never done before. We're going to go to a place we've never gone before. We're going to take the old processes and we're going to breathe life into it because you can't put new wine into old wineskins. So you need a new wineskin for the new wine, which means that there's going to be certain things that are totally new. We ain't never done it before. But we need to step into the realm of ingenuity, innovation, ingenuity. We can't get in this way, no problem, we'll go up. In this new season, just like these five guys, new vision, we need these three things. You need initiative. We need intentionality. And we need ingenuity. And we've got to find new initiative New intentionality, new ingenuity on this side of the season. What we have for the past 24 years was good. What we've experienced for the past eight years was great. But new wine requires new wineskins. So our prayer is God makes us brand new at the end of this year. Lord, give me new initiative. Give me new intentionality. Give me new ingenuity. We do what we can, then God does the miraculous. They got as far as they could go. They exhausted every bit of energy, creativity to accomplish the goal. They got their friends to Jesus. And then Jesus looks at them in response to their faith and gives their buddy what only he could give. The healing of his body, but don't miss the forgiveness of his sins. Because that new body that he received, he would have to die again. He could walk now, but one day he was going to have to transition from life to death, but what he really got was eternal life. See, all the things that we quote unquote have faith for in the earth are going to pass away. All the things that we long for, the achievements that we fight so hard for, every achievement that you pursue now, whether it's in the marketplace or in your career, I hope you know that one day somebody's going to have your job. Either you're going to retire, you're going to do something else. I need you to know that any earthly pursuit, any house that we can pursue, any car that we want so bad, any pair of shoes, any piece of jewelry, any American dream that we're fixated on, All those things will pass away. But our relationship with Jesus will literally stand the test of time. And only what we do that's built on the solid rock and the precious metals, if it's built on sand, it's going to wash away. But if it's on a firm foundation, the winds may blow, the rains may fall, but that house will stand If it's precious metals and precious stones, the fire will come. It'll burn away all the dross. It'll burn away all of the straw. It'll burn away all of the organic stuff. But that which was true will hold through the fire. And you know what people begin to say? You had the Pharisees hating in the crowd. But then there was a buzz amongst the people. Did y'all see what Jesus did? Did you see what happened to that man? He was paralyzed, and now he's walking. And over they began to say amongst themselves, Pastor Tanya, 
we have seen remarkable things. We have seen remarkable things. Remarkable things, an event or an occurrence that is beyond one's belief or understanding. We've seen something that is beyond the possible. And they begin to talk amongst themselves and they begin to glorify God because they have witnessed something remarkable. Do you believe that God is not done doing remarkable things? Do you believe that the same God who healed the paralytic man is the same God who can heal today? Do you believe that the same Jesus who healed the man according to scriptures, was crucified. But a remarkable thing happened on the third day. He had a bodily resurrection with all power in his hands. That was remarkable, something they'd never seen before. And according to the scripture, he's sitting on the right hand of the Father making intercession for us. But I'm here to tell you that I still believe in the God of miracles. I believe in the God that's still moving his people. I believe that the same God who was Abraham, with Abraham, with Isaac, with Jacob, with Moses, with David, I'm just crazy enough to believe that he's the same God that's with New Vision. For every body of people that call on the name of the Lord, that has a unique DNA and purpose, I'm here to tell you that God still moves his people from one place to the next. New Vision, get ready for the remarkable. Let me prophesy this. Eyes haven't seen, ears haven't heard, nor have it entered to the heart of man. If you think this is all that God can do, you got another thing coming because God is always able to do exceedingly and abundantly above all we can ask or think. So this is the season where we need to start asking different things. We need to start asking for different things. And listen, I'm not just talking about stuff. I'm talking about souls. We need to ask for souls to be saved. We need to ask for the harvest to come. We need to ask for those who are hurting and broken to know that there is a man who healed the paralytic and there is a man that can heal them. We need to ask for the broken places to be restored. We need to ask for the compassion and the love of God to flow into places where people are hurting, that light would pervade and overcome darkness. When you start asking God for those type of things and seeking first his kingdom and his righteousness, an expanded building is nothing when you seek his heart. More money and resources is nothing to him when you seek first his face. Seek his face. Then you'll receive his hand. Are you willing to seek him again? Are you willing to come to Jesus again? Are you willing to press to get as close to Jesus as you can physically or spiritually get in order to position yourself for the remarkable. If you could please stand in this moment. We've come this far by faith. Christ is my firm foundation, the rock on which I stand. When everything around me is shaking, I've never been more glad that I put my faith <laughs> Not for stuff. I put my faith in Jesus. Stuff will let you down. Jobs are great at the beginning. I've had employers let me down. But Jesus has never let me down. He's faithful from generation. So why would he fail now? He won't. So right now, as you lift your hands, this one was going to it's going to happen very quickly. Last Sunday, we had a time. We were, <laughs> this, was, this was after the overflow. And we were sitting with Bishop and Lady Sharon, and we were re recounting the moment. It's been a while since Bishop called an altar call here. I said, Bishop, the altar is hot here. You call an altar call, people are going to come. So you remember we called up myself and Pastor Lindsay and Lady Sharon, and people started coming. And we had to pray and lay hands on all of them. And then it was overwhelming, so we started activating other pastors, elders, adjutants, ministers in training. If you, <laughs> he's activating everybody to handle the overflow on the altar. 
And we went through like, like about an hour and a half, two hours of just the power of God. God works in diverse ways. We're not going to do that today. Hallelujah. <laughs> but we're going to take a cue from the scripture. They got as close to Jesus as they could, and Jesus, seeing their faith, spoke a word. Jesus didn't have to lay hands on the paralytic man to get him up to walk. Jesus didn't have to lay hands on the man to have his sins forgiven. He looked at him. He spoke. (laughs) And he felt the weight of guilt and shame remove him because he had been forgiven of his sins. Jesus spoke again, and all of a sudden... I got feeling in my legs. And he did something he hadn't done. I don't know if he was born paralytic or if he had just been paralyzed for a season in his life. He did something. He walked and his legs worked because Jesus saw his faith and spoke. Somehow he spoke to his soul and he spoke to the natural realm. He spoke to the molecules within his body at the cellular level. Somehow muscles that have been atrophied for years strengthened instantaneously. Something happened within his body where he could now walk. He saw their faith. So as we sing this song, we're going to sing a verse of it. And then we're going to look forward to a remarkable thing. And God's going to do something in this moment. Very quickly, your level of expectation is important to this moment. But what is our faith? Our faith is not for something. Our faith is in Jesus. So if we reestablish our faith in Jesus, then healing is a small thing. And even if our healing doesn't come today, if our faith in Jesus is restored, we hit the jackpot. Because what we need is him. More than I need lack of pain in my back, I need him. More than I need another dollar or another paycheck, I need him. If I get him, I've got everything I need. Come on, lift your hands. Christ is my firm foundation. foundation. The rock on which I stand. The rock on which I stand. When everything around me is shaken. I've never been more glad. I've never been more glad. I put my faith. I put my faith in Jesus. My faith is in Jesus. He's never let me down. He's faithful from generation. So why would he fail now? So why would he fail now? He won't fail. He won't. still got joy in chaos. I've got peace that makes no sense. And I won't be going under. I'm not held by my own strength. Cause I built my life on Jesus. He's never let me down. He's faithful through Jesus.
is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For years, there was a longing for Messiah to arrive. Jesus came, fulfilled that role, conquered death in the grave. He is our reward. I want you now, spiritually speaking, to lock eyes with Jesus. According to what you need, press to make a connection with him right now. If there be any faith in you, he sees that faith. He sees that faith. He knows what you need. Be reminded that you have a father in heaven who knows what you need. Even as you express your need before him, just bask in the fact that you have a direct line to him. Just embrace the reality that you're in relationship with him. And if you're not in relationship with him, I want to let you know that Jesus wants relationship with you. Jesus is still saving souls. If you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart, the Lord Jesus, that the Father raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. Salvation is still coming to those who desire it. But like the four men with the paralytic, you got to be willing to press past the crowd to go to where he is. But once you get to him, not only can physical things happen through his power, he's well capable and able, but he has the ability to forgive sins. He has the ability to secure your eternal faith. 
So, Father, we come before you recognizing the authority that Jesus has, recognizing that you can save by many, you can save by few, recognizing that you can distribute your power through the laying on of hands, and then you can use a voice in a moment. Father, I declare healing for those who need it. According to their faith in you, Father, would you attend to their needs? You know what's happening in their body physically. You know what their financial need is. You know what struggles they're dealing with and wrestling with. Father, may our faith in you be strengthened regardless of what comes next. We want to stand here and affirm our commitment to you once again. Affirm our love for you once again. Affirm that we are standing on the firm foundation again. And to acknowledge that you are our only hope. And we reaffirm and reconfirm our hope and commitment in you today. Father, remarkable things are coming. Your Holy Spirit is still doing remarkable things. So we continue to follow the work of the Holy Spirit in this house, new vision, and in our lives personally. Father, we want to see your glory revealed. And so we are willing to go. We're willing to take initiative. We're willing to walk in intentionality. We are willing, Father God, to practice ingenuity. And we'll do all that we can, believing that there are certain things that only you can do because you're able. <laughs> Hallelujah. So wind of Holy Spirit, meet people in the place of their need. Supply them where there's lack. Empower them where they feel disempowered. Speak to them where they feel like they can't hear you. Give them the energy they need where they feel fatigued. And Father, may you continue to guide this movement. Take us where we need to go. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Listen to me. We're going to release the benediction. But if we could have some of our PLT members and our intercessors just available at the altar. If you just need someone to pray after the benediction or you want to give your life to Jesus we need to develop that practice and a habit of being ready to minister to people beyond the moment beyond the benediction ordained ministers as well um, if you are in this crowd and you need an additional touch you need a conversation you need prayer we've got people y'all come on step up elder we got PLT members, we got intercessors, we got ministers. They're here. If you need that touch, you need that prayer, they're here. Y'all got that? Y'all got that? Y'all still with me? Benediction is coming. We have some friends here today from the city. Uh, we have our mayor, Mayor Gannon, is here. Thank you for joining us. Co-labor in the gospel, Reverend Stallworth, thank you guys for joining us today. Thank you for joining us. Um, they had many places they had to go today. Um, and they're going to be here, you know, in the lobby, in the atrium. Food court is still open. All that stuff is open. Uh, they would love to get to meet many of you. Um, let us pray. Father, we thank you for all that you have done. We even thank you for the ministry that's beginning at the altar. We thank you, Father, for your power and your ability. We thank you that our trust is in you. Our faith is in you, Father. Our faith is in you, Jesus. And we walk out of here filled with faith. We've come this far by faith. And we'll get to the next place by faith. Father, I release a blessing over this congregation. May they walk in the confidence, not of themselves, but the confidence of who you are. And thank God for what you're going to do in their life. Remarkable things are coming. Thank you, God for the remarkable things that you are doing. May your peace rest upon them, your grace and your peace. And may we continue to become all that you called us to be. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.